Hey class, and welcome back to chapter 9. We're going to continue our discussion of rotational motion. Um, as I mentioned, chapter 8 was the start of really redoing everything we've done from the beginning of the semester and applying it to rotation. We're now going to continue that. So we looked at rotational <clears throat> kinematics, rotational motion, rotational equations of motion in the last chapter. And so now we're going to look at, you know, kind of the force equivalent of rotation which is known as torque and then just like with forces we did some of the forces equals zero for equilibrium some of the forces equals ma newton's laws right as they apply to linear motion we're now going to look at newton's laws as they apply to rotational motion so his first law the idea of inertia and the idea of if there's no net external forces then an object will continue with its motion we're now going to do the same thing with rotation if there's no net outside torque then your object is going to remain in what we call equilibrium. So we're going to start with that here in this video, and then in the next one we're going to look at what happens when the net torque is not zero, so the equivalent of Newton's second law, and then we'll build from there. So again, so far we've just been dealing with translational motion, something moving in a straight line in some direction, or even in a curved path, but just simply moving linearly. And now we're going to look at things that are both translating and rotating, okay? So if you look in the world around you, you see things that translate and rotate all the time, right? Whether you're shooting a basketball, throwing a football, um, even just watching a car with its wheels that are moving down the road, you see things that move translationally and rotationally together all the time. And so we need to understand more about rotational kinematics and rotational physics in order to really describe the world around us. All right, so thinking back to Newton's second law, right, it said if there's a net force, then an object has acceleration. If there's no net force, then an object will continue with its current motion. So what about angular acceleration? Well, as I already pretty much gave away at the beginning of this video, the thing that would cause something to experience an angular acceleration is not just a force, but what's known as a torque. So the question is, what is torque? Well, if you think about it, right, I have a ruler right here, okay? I can take this and I can apply a force in a lot of different ways. I can apply the force straight down at the edge. I can kind of push in from the side. I can push up from underneath. I can apply forces at an angle. And each of those are going to make this ruler want to rotate different amounts. In fact, if I wanted to balance a weight on the end of this meter stick, the amount I have to push up varies depending on where I apply that force or push down on the opposite side. I mean, for example, I can even, you know, hang this small little mass off of one side, place a bigger mass on the other side, and if I find the right balance point, the small mass can completely support the larger one, even though their masses are very different because their force that they each have, the force due to gravity, their weight, is being applied at different locations or distances away from where I'm supporting it. So, fumble, all right? So torque then, as we can hopefully deduce from that real exciting demonstration I just did, um, we should be able to deduce that torque depends both on the magnitude of forces, but also where and how they're applied. If we think about this door, right, which of these forces is gonna be the easiest to open the door? Well, clearly this force, right? If you're trying to do this to open a door, then, well, you need to take a lot more physics, okay? Here you could open the door, but you're gonna need much more force than if you applied it further away from the axis of rotation, all right? So the amount of torque, as we're gonna learn about, depends on the force applied as well as where that is in relation to the axis of rotation. So again, just so we understand and define that term, the axis of rotation is the point about which your object is naturally gonna to wanna to rotate. Okay, so this really can vary actually quite a bit. You know, if I take my mass here and I have it, you know, this isn't the best picture, but just sitting on a flat surface, if I push this here at the top, the axis about which it's going to rotate is actually this bottom point because it's tipping there. That's what happens when you knock over like a water glass, which I did just the other day, that type of thing. Um, with my meter stick, meter stick, this is actually just a foot ruler. Anyway, this object right? The axis of rotation can really be defined. If I put my finger at different points, that's going to be the natural point about which it wants to rotate. And if I hang a mass here at the end, then I can actually move my finger here to try to find the natural balance point about which it wants to rotate. 
So there it's balanced. If I pull it a little further, the meter stick, the meter stick again, the ruler side is actually heavier. So it rotates down, it experiences an angular acceleration. If I go back the other way, oh, there we go, fumble. All right. So let's go ahead and define torque a little more specifically. Okay. So torque, as we just observed, is about not only the force being applied, all right, but also where that is being applied. And so the way we quantify the magnitude of torque is it's equal to the magnitude of the force being applied multiplied by what we call the lever arm distance. All right, so as you can kind of see in this picture, torque can be a force times, in this case, the lever arm distance is just the width of the door. Over here, if you applied the same force at an angle, all right, your lever arm distance would actually be shorter. So what the lever arm distance is, it's the shortest possible distance from your axis of rotation to what we call the line of action of a force. So the line of action is a line sort of extending to infinity going through a going through the force, excuse me, um, running through the force. It's just a line extending to infinity in both directions. And the lever arm distance is the shortest distance from the axis to that point. Let me show you another example or on my so let's imagine, you don't have to imagine, I drew it for you, but you have, well, we do have to imagine, I guess. Let's assume this is a wrench. It's a little funny looking because that's my artistic abilities. And we're using it to loosen or tighten a bolt. I guess we're going to go, let's see, lefty, loosey, righty, tighty. So we're going to be tightening the bolt by pulling up on the wrench here. So here's our axis of rotation, right? So as we've already seen, if I apply the force straight up, pulling at the end, my lever arm distance is the shortest distance to the line of action. So if this is my force F, this is my line of action. It's just this line running through my force going to infinity, right? And so from my axis, I could really draw a lever or a distance to that axis that could be all different kinds of lengths, right? I could draw there, that's a distance from the axis to my line of action or down here or here. But the only one that's the lever arm distance is that perpendicular, the shortest possible distance. So the distance is perpendicular from my axis to my line of action. All right, so now if I were to take the same setup here to erase some of these lines, and now if we were to take and apply the force for some strange reason at a different angle, all right, so now we take and we apply that same force at an angle like this. All right, now our line of action is here. That's our line of action extending to infinity. And so now that straight distance along the um, wrench here, that's no longer our shortest possible distance. That's not perpendicular. This angle here is not 90 degrees. Instead, the perpendicular distance, let's see, it's probably somewhere up here right? And it just happened to be at the end of my arrow, but that's totally a fluke, right? I could have made my arrow a lot smaller to represent my force, and that's still the perpendicular distance, okay? So again, this here would be my lever arm distance. And so what you always need to do is figure out the amount of force that's perpendicular to some distance or the distance that's perpendicular to the force. Is a really cool kind of thing that you can do with some of these, right? So here we're going to take the force F to find the torque. It's going to be equal to the magnitude of our force F multiplied by that lever arm distance, which we usually use a cursive L to represent. But you could take this same setup, okay? It's a little bit getting ugly here. Let's say you have that same force F. Now let's break it into components. So let's say it has some Fy and some Fx. The cool thing here is check it out. For Fx, the x component of the force, its lever arm distance is zero. Fx, the torque due to Fx is zero. It has no torque because it has no rotation that it's going to cause. There's no lever arm distance. Fy, on the other hand, is the only thing generating the torque. And for Fy, the lever arm distance is just that same initial length of our wrench. 
So you can basically either find the perpendicular component of force, perpendicular to some known distance, or you can take and find the perpendicular distance to the line of action of our force. Both of those two things give you the exact same value for torque. And I'm going to show you this in different examples and with some pictures going forward. But it's a concept that tends to confuse people a little bit. So I really wanted to kind of drive it home that we're talking about torque. We're talking about a force and a distance. And those two things must be perpendicular to one another. Whatever geometry you need to do to make that happen you, is up to you. Some people get confused with the line of action thing. And so that's why I wanted to show you that you can just find the perpendicular component of your force if you already know a distance. All right, looking here at torque, it's actually a vector quantity, okay? So it's something that's gonna have a magnitude and a direction. The direction, again, confuses us. Its direction is actually based on the type of rotation it causes about the axis. And so just like we talked about with rotational motion, we're gonna define counterclockwise as the positive direction. So counterclockwise rotation would be a positive torque, clockwise rotation would generate a negative torque. And the units that we're gonna be using, the SI units are Newtons times meters. Now notice, I mentioned this before, Newtons times meters, back in chapter seven, I think it was, or six, right? Yeah, six, gave us, Newtons multiplied by meters gave us joules, that's energy, right? So now we have newtons times meters, but it is not joules. What's the difference? Well, in chapter six, newtons times meters were when they were in the same direction, right? Your force times the parallel component to the distance, okay? Or the parallel component of the force multiplied by the distance, however you wanted to do it. Now they're perpendicular. And so these units are technically different from one another. So be careful. All right, so just to kind of drive home this line of action idea, again, if you have F1, boom, that green line represents your line of action. And so you can see this little cursive L1 right here is your lever arm for force one. For force two, boom, there's your line of action. And so therefore, this little cursive L2 would be your perpendicular distance. What about F3? Well, if we extend its line of action, it runs right through our axis of rotation. Point O we're defining as our axis. It runs right through it, so therefore the lever arm distance is zero, and therefore the net torque is zero. So even though F3 is a force acting, its torque is still going to be zero because it causes no rotation. It would just try to make that weird kidney bean looking thing slide sideways but not rotate at all. F1 would make it want to rotate counterclockwise, so therefore that's a positive torque. F2 would make it go clockwise, so that's a negative torque. So here's a wrench picture that might look a little bit nicer than mine, debatably. Okay, so here you have a wrench. We have three forces, FA, FB, FC. All right, which of these cause a non-zero torque? Well, I'm hoping you can guess by now. A and B would both cause a non-zero torque, while C, its torque would be zero because its line of action runs through the axis of rotation. All right, and so if we try to figure out if all three of these applied the same force, which one would be most likely to loosen the bolt? Oh, sorry, I don't have another slide for that. It would be FB because its lever arm distance is so much longer. So that's why a lot of times if you're trying to loosen a bolt like this um, or an old rusty pipe or something and you can't do it just by itself, something that plumbers will do is they'll take a long piece of pipe, they'll slide it over the back of their wrench and then apply a force to the end of that, all right? It assists them because it increases their lever arm distance or it increases their amount of leverage, right? Leverage comes from that idea of a lever, a lever arm. You're increasing the lever arm, and so therefore you have more leverage and you don't need as much force. All right, so let's do an example problem here just so that we understand, okay? So the tendon, attached to your, uh, or excuse me, your Achilles tendon, which is the tendon that's attached to the back of your heel, as well as to the calf muscle, all right? Let's say it attaches approximately at this point P back here, and let's approximate that the axis of rotation for our ankle joint is right here, where the leg bone's attached to the foot, all right? So if that's the situation, here's the geometry, you could get out, you know, your own little 
what I call meter stick ruler to measure your own ankle if you want instead of using my numbers. But let's say that the Achilles tendon applies a force of about 720 newtons of tension. So it's pulling upward on the back of your heel. Okay. My question to you then is what is the net torque, magnitude and direction that this force causes on your foot? So what is the net torque about this axis of rotation? Okay, give it a go, pause the video, go, go, go. All right, so torque is equal to force times lever arm distance or force times a perpendicular R distance. You can write it that way as well. Sometimes you'll see that, all right? If we look here, here's our force. The distance that we're given of 3.6 centimeters is not our lever arm distance. It's not perpendicular to our force. Instead, the lever arm distance is here, which we're shown is 55 degrees off of the known distance that we're able to measure. And so to find our lever arm distance, right, we need to take that and multiply the 3.6 centimeters by cosine of 55 to get the lever arm. And so the net torque is going to be equal to our force multiplied by our lever arm distance. Now all of these values look to be positive, but our net torque is actually a negative value because it's causing clockwise rotation. So don't forget that negative sign. Probably I should have popped it in up here as well. But I didn't, so you see it down here. And so boom, our answer is a box worthy 15 Newton meters in the clockwise direction. All right, so that's an introduction to the idea of torque. And now the first application we're going to cover just in this video before pausing it and then continuing on to the next video is equilibrium. So that means that your object has no net external torques acting on it. That doesn't mean there's no torque. It just means the summing up, the adding up of all the torques equals zero. So a good example of this is playing on a teeter-totter. Here's a fun little picture I found of two people who got bored while camping and wanted more physics fun, so they decided to build their own teeter-totter out in the woods. So if your object is in rigid body equilibrium, that means it's not accelerating linearly and it's not experiencing angular acceleration. So that means that not only are your net forces in the x and y direction zero, but your net torque is also equal to zero. So what this means now is I can give you problems dealing with rigid body, rigid body equilibrium and I can give you three different unknowns and ask you to solve for all three of those unknowns. So get excited. There's some good examples on our Foxtail site, kind of longer example problems of this. I'm just going to do one here um, for the sake of time, but check out those other ones as well, and you'll get to practice it a lot with your homework. All right. So again, just to be really kind of belt and suspender, sure you understand, rigid body equilibrium means that the net acceleration is zero linearly and the net angular acceleration is also zero, so there's no net external forces and there's no net external torques. Again, that doesn't mean there's no force and there's no torque, it just means the summing up of them is zero, as we see here. So again, if we go back to my kind of example where I had this little mass hanging on here to support the much larger mass, and if I kind of, just to be safe and be less likely to tip the thing over, balanced it on my two fingers here. Okay, oh, 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 that's close. Right there, rigid body equilibrium. Now there's lots of forces. The ruler has a weight. Each of these two both have mass, therefore they have weight. My fingers are pushing up on the ruler, but the adding up of all the forces and torques equals zero. So in fact, just looking at this, you should be able to, sitting at home, calculate how hard I have to push up to keep this thing nice and balanced. You can also calculate exactly where on the ruler my finger should be in order for it to be balanced, all right? The amount I push up, some of the forces should just be equal to these two weights plus the weight of the ruler, and the location, you do some of the torques. There's a torque from this weight at this distance, there's a torque from this weight at this distance, and there's actually a torque from the ruler at its center of mass acting straight down as well. So that's the kind of thing you're going to get to do, get pumped. All right, so again, if something's in equilibrium, in this case, if there's just two forces acting and then the pivot point is at the center, so the weight of their kind of 
log or whatever they're sitting on doesn't generate a torque. In order for it to be in rigid body equilibrium, these two torques generated by their two weights must be equal and opposite. So if they have the same weight, that's going to be at the same distance. Now, so R1 and R2 would be the same if W1 and W2 are the same. Now, if you got somebody much larger who went out to go camping, it's kind of a funny looking picture. But now if W2 is much larger than W1, then your different radial distances would have to be different as well. R2 would be much smaller than R1. All right, so before we do our example, let's go over the kind of problem solving strategy we're going to be covering here. So first things first, you always are going to choose an object that is in equilibrium. So when I was talking about my example I was doing, all right, there's multiple things involved, my hands, the weights, and the meter stick. I keep calling it that, the ruler. Okay, the ruler was my rigid body, all right? It's the object that I chose, and it's the object that I would then analyze in my problem-solving process. So I would take it, and I would draw a free body diagram labeling all the forces on it, so it's got its own weight, the two forces from the two other things hanging off of it, and the force from my fingers pushing up. And you now are gonna draw those where they're acting. So instead of just taking my object and making it a point and drawing all the forces off of it in a free body diagram, I'm now gonna draw the meter stick in its shape and draw the forces acting at their locations, okay? You set up X and Y axes, and then you start applying your equilibrium equations. Some of the forces in the X is zero, some of the forces in the Y is zero, some of the torques equal zero as well. When you get to doing some of the torques, if it's in equilibrium, right, what's the axis of rotation? It's not rotating. Guess what? Boom, you get to choose. So in my setup, I could choose the location of my fingers as my axis of rotation, or I could choose over here where this mass is hanging or the center, anywhere the equation still is true. It's not rotating, so I can still set it up and solve appropriately. From there, you solve and hopefully get some box-worthy answers. All right, here's our example. I want you to try it out, pause it, and then we'll go through it together, and then we'll wrap up this video. So let's imagine that there's a woman. Our, our neighbors actually just put in a swimming pool in their backyard. He's also a George Fox professor. So they just put in a swimming pool in our backyard, and let's imagine that somebody, a woman who weighs 530 newtons, stands at the very end of the diving board, getting ready to jump into the pool. We're told that that diving board has a total length of 3.9 meters, all right? For now, for simplicity on this problem, we're gonna ignore the weight of the diving board. Let's act like it's negligible compared to her weight. Um, and then there's a fulcrum, and with a lot of diving boards, you can actually adjust where that fulcrum is. There's like a big wheel where you can move it back and forth. Pretty cool physics involved there. It's 1.4 meters away from the end of the diving board. And then in the very end of the diving board, there's got to be some sort of bolt or something holding it down. So again, apparently this is like the most useful ruler in today's uh, kind of setup. So there's a, a, oh boy, gravity. All right, so let's hang it. Maybe we'll hang it. That'll be easier. So what we have is the person standing on the end. We have a fulcrum. 1.4 meters away, and then at the far end of the diving board, there's got to be a bolt or something holding the diving board in place. So I'm asking you to find the force that the bolt exerts on the diving board here, pushing, you know, holding it down, as well as the force of the fulcrum pushing up. All right, so pause the video. Try not to drop too many things towards your computer. My computer's fine, luckily, and give it a go. All right, hopefully you paused and gave it a go. Hopefully you started with a free body diagram, right? So here's the drawing. Here's the lady at the end of the diving board. Here's the fulcrum. And here's the bolt holding it in place. So for my free body diagram, I drew an upward force from the fulcrum pushing up on the board, her weight pushing down on the board, and then the bolt pushing down. So the board is what I chose for my rigid body that I was going to analyze. I labeled some of the distance that I distances that I was given. Some of you might have went ahead and wanted to choose here or here as your axis. Both are totally fine. I went ahead and chose the end because that's where my two distances are relative to. But you can observe, right, this distance from F2 to the weight is just 2.5 meters. So you could have used that as well. So now we want to solve. We identified our object. We drew a good picture and free body diagram. And so from here, we want to set up some of the torques and some of the forces. All right. 
So because this is a chapter about torque, I decided to start there. Some of you might have wanted to start with some of the forces, totally fine as well. All right, but I'm choosing this point A as my axis. So each force F2 and W are going to generate a torque. F1 has zero torque. How do I know that? Because its lever arm distance is zero. So F2, its lever arm distance is, distance is labeled as L2. That's the 1.4 meters. And it's pushing up. So here's my axis. It's pushing up. That's going to cause counterclockwise rotation. So that's a positive torque. The weight with lever arm down here of 3.9 meters, that's going to cause clockwise rotation. So that's a negative torque. So I have F2 times L2 minus W times LW equals zero. That's the sum of the torques about that axis of rotation. And so since I know the weight in both of the lever arms, I can solve for F2 simply plugging and chugging the weight and the two lever arms. Boom, F2, the fulcrum's force up is a box worthy 1,480 newtons. Now to finish though, I still was asked to find what's the force of the bolt. So now I can go back to my sum of the forces, knowing that my net force equals zero. So F2 is positive, F1 is negative, W is negative, and the, again, we have equilibrium, so you sum them up to zero. And then we can just go ahead and solve for F1, and it would be 950 newtons, which once again is Foxworthy. So that wraps up the first chunk of chapter nine. It's a bit of a long chapter, so I'm gonna break this into three different videos. So stay tuned for now as we move on to applying this same concepts to Newton's second law when you no longer have zero net force. Have a box worthy day.